Welcome back to our series on the mother load. We're looking at session number four today, um, and I've titled it The Mothering of the Holy Spirit. There's something extremely, profoundly, deep, unspeakably intimate about the connection that we have to mother. The environment of the womb uh, is it's one of our oldest memories of our existence, and it's deep within our um, subconscious layers. We can't even remember thinking when we were in the womb, but I'm sure we have. We have absolutely no concept of how deeply important this relationship is to the actual formation of our identity. At the atmosphere and condition of the womb of your mother, in fact, greatly affected your development as an individual on a spiritual level and on a physical level. And when you come out of the womb, the touch of your mother and the sound of her voice is one of the first most powerful primeval things that imprints upon you. It represents the core touchstone that your hope and your confidence that the whole identity of your life is built on. And it's literally your first love. If our physical relationship to mother and our mothers is really only a pale shadow of the original parenting relationship we've had with the Trinity, well, suddenly it becomes uh, very important to us and uh, critically important to reestablish this functioning in our life. And the work of the Holy Spirit um, as a member of the Trinity, if you want to look at it this way, we know because Jesus refers to him many times, he says the Father or Abba. So we've got at the members of the Trinity, we've got Father. In the last 20 years or so, there's been a massive anointing to restore the fathering uh, to the family and also the family of the church. When Jesus came, he came as a brother or as a sibling, even though he was Lord, he came among us as a brother and as a friend. And finally, something we don't think about, nor does the, preach, the, the church preach about it very much, but the role of the Holy Spirit and his description uh, that Jesus gives in the Gospels is actually an uncannily uh, echoing description of mothering because it is the job the holy spirit represents the office if you will of mother in the um, functioning of the trinity and of course you know i'm making very clear-cut distinctions which in the actual functioning of the trinity i'm sure it's not that cut and dried but just for the simplicity we're going to look at the work of the holy spirit because the work of the Holy Spirit is really to restore us to the mother load of God's presence um, from which we were separated by a fallen condition. And we, because of the fall, we inherited a whole plethora of negative emotions that the Lord never intended us to experience or know. Fear, abandonment, rejection, trauma, uh, these are but a few of what happened um, when we took that fruit from the knowledge of good and evil. It's the job of the Holy Spirit to take us back to that place of utter security, the womb of the morning star, and also the flow of the river of God, the life of God within us, uh, which is the mother load, the giftings where our spirit is joined to the spirit of Jesus. And so we tap into all the wealth of heaven through our spiritual man. Um, it's this place of the womb of the morning star is a place of perfect safety. It's a place of supply and destiny. It's a place where all the curse of hatred and rejection and estrangement gets broken off our spirit. And even as a child looks to the wisdom of a parent to teach them, to navigate them through the external worlds of danger and also the internal 
hidden world of feelings, desires, appetites. So too, even more desperately, do we need the parenting of the Holy Spirit, because he represents the more feminine side, if you will, in the duality of parenting. And I'm not trying to start some strange mother-goddess cult here. That's the last thing I believe in. But we also need to give the feminine proper place in the functioning of the Trinity. Otherwise, we're going to be in a deficit that in our lives and in our spirits that is not going to be good for us. Modern psychology actually states that we are all longing, everything we do in our life is actually a longing to come back to that place of the comfort and security of the womb. Even modern psychologists think that. And apparently the Holy Spirit thinks it too, because that's what he's trying to do. He is described as the comforter. And uh, if you were, have you ever done this? Uh, maybe you've gone on a first date or you've taken someone out to dinner socially. Uh, did you ever have the ability, did your conversation just stay on a very superficial level? Or did you have one of those moments when you, maybe you said it overtly, maybe it was said covertly through the dialogue or the subtext, tell me who you are. Tell me who you really are. And it was a very honest and heartfelt dialogue. If you could explain something really important about yourself to someone right from the beginning, what would it be? Well, this is the kind of dialogue and vulnerability, integrity, authenticity that we are longing for in life. And the Holy Spirit is able to give that to us and to impart the things of Jesus to us. Isaiah 66, 13 makes this promise, and God is speaking to the exiles whom he is going to return home. He uses this analogy, Isaiah 66, 13, as one whom his mother comforts, so will I comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. So the Lord is highlighting a very particular set of feminine behaviors, of maternal instincts. And he says, they come from me, and I'm going to treat my people this way. I'm going to restore that level of primeval comfort after these terrible uh, and wounding exile conditions. So in our first introduction to the mother load, we looked at the scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that talks, uh, gives us deep insight into this same Holy Spirit that brooded over the chaos in Genesis 1. He brooded over the chaos of creation and brought order, light, darkness, form, uh, seas, land, creatures, you name it, seasons, day and night. Um, but also the Holy Spirit isn't just functioning on that huge universal cosmic macro layer, but he's also functioning deep and intimately within our spirits. And there, this scripture gives us very profound insight because deep is calling unto deep. The deep of God's spirit is calling unto the deep of our spirits. And this is the process that is going on when we receive the Lord and when we uh, step into the process of sanctification and even to a higher level when we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and other gifts of the charismata that the Lord would like to bestow on us at a higher prophetic level. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 to 16. But as it is written, eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them to us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, no man knows the things of God, but the Spirit of God. Now we have all received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us by God. These things also we speak not in the words which men's wisdom teaches, 
but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things which spiritual. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You know, um, those who do great explorations, it's, it's within man to explore his environment. And uh, from uh, the 1960s onward, we actually have left the Earth to explore the moon and other planets. But do you know that up until recently and the development of certain um, alloys and uh, com composite materials that are, that are necessary to take us into the environments of outer space, until they were uh, invented, we actually did not even have the capability to explore our own planet to the depths, like to go to the bottom of the sea. The sea is very, very deep. It's a, there's deep abysses in various places, but we simply did not have the technology required. Uh, our little bathyscopes, if you will, could only descend to certain levels because we did not have the capability to withstand the pressures and temperatures and other dangers of these deep environments. Well, it is the work and the job of the Holy Spirit to take us down into the deep and somewhat dangerous places of our own selves, of our own nature. We are, in fact, exceedingly deep. The soul is magnificent, it's precious, and it's very uh, created in the image we are created in the image of our Creator, and we are fearfully and wonderfully made. But man in his fallen state cannot explore the deeps of the soul. We simply do not have the capability. It takes the partnership of the Holy Spirit to enable us to go deep within ourselves, deep into these hidden, primordial, primal layers of our desire, our memory, our conscience, our appetite, uh, and redeem. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. He takes us down. We can trust him in these unknown regions. Like space-age bathyscopes made with cutting-edge design and the latest technology, he knows how to surround us and protect us as he takes us down into these deep places, into the layers of the past, into family genetics, issues, failures, traumas, temptations. We absolutely must have the Holy Spirit to go into these places and see them healed. All else is simply learning how to cope. It's not real redemption. Even the power of our ancestors is imprinted on us. We, in modern day psychological jargon, it's called genetic memory. And through the, through the testing of rats that they've done and other smaller creatures, they know that they can inflict a trauma on one generation and four generations later of rats, the rats will still flee at the uh, impulse or the stimulus of that same uh, trauma. And what that is telling scientists is that trauma, especially fear, is imprinted on the genetic memory and it will move down the, the course of the generations. So if we know that's what happens in rats, we can be sure that we've inherited some trauma from the things that our ancestors went through. And they are imprinted culturally and genetically upon us in ways we cannot even begin to perceive or understand. But it is known to the Holy Spirit. Some of us have... Uh, scripture does mention that in the night, as we sleep and as we dream, these deep, uh, ancient voices actually speak to us. And we can hear their voices. And it, it, it usually stirs up fear is what it does. 
but it is the mandate of the Trinity to escort us back to our identity in the Lord. It's his job to restore our understanding of what our destiny is and to supply to us every resource we need to get there. He's going to prove to us that we are made in the very image and presence of God. And he's going to become our holy mirror through which we see our redeemed and restored selves. The Holy Spirit is the nurturer, the nourisher, the corrector. He disciplines, directs, defends us against everyone and even against our own inner voices of fear, hatred, and condemnation. We can trust him. We can trust him more than our own concepts and understanding of ourselves. In John 14, Jesus said some very powerful things about the Holy Spirit. He said this, uh, John 14, verse 24 to 27. Jesus answered and said to him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He that loves me not keeps not my sayings, but the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. These things I have spoken to you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said to you. So the word here that Jesus uses, the Greek word parakletos, and that covers an extremely wide range of meanings. It means primarily the comforter, but it also means an advocate, which could be in a legal or forensic sense, a helper, uh, someone who comes alongside, an intercessor, a consoler. Um, it, it is someone who advocates for you even when you don't know you need it or you can't even put into words what it is you need. Um, comfort is an interesting subject to consider. Comfort is not necessarily only material possessions or even sexual or sensually based issues. Uh, these are actually very poor counterfeits for fulfillment. Comfort is essentially a spiritual issue which can only be answered by the presence of the Holy Spirit. So let's just define it. Comfort from the Latin fortis, which means to make strong. A mental or physical state of ease and satisfaction where one is free from pain, danger, or fear. Something that brings relief, consolation, satisfaction, well-being, cheer, or reassurance. To comfort means to free from pain or constraint, alleviation of distress. So one of the major offices of the presence of the Holy Spirit is that of a comforter. And Jesus flat out promises before the whole traumatic sequence of the garden, the trial, the crucifixion, he will not leave them comfortless. And no one knows the deep vulnerabilities, the upheavals, diseases of grief and pain that the human spirit is subject to like Jesus. He's the king of sorrows, and he understands comfort is crucial. Psalm 73. Psalm 73. I find this a very interesting. Um, let's just set the stage for the need of the soul for comfort. And Psalm 73 describes what believers, the, the whole world we live in as believers or unbelievers, but from a believer's perspective of when evil is dominating, when unbelief is dominating, when the world is being run by a pagan spirit, an antichrist spirit, wicked man, there's this grief that comes upon the heart of an unbeliever. And Psalm 73 examines that. We're going to look at verses 1 to 3, 12 to 14, and 21 to 22. Psalm 73, 1. Truly, God is good to Israel, even those who are upright and pure in heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious of the foolish and arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. 
Behold, these are the ungodly who always prosper and are at ease in the world. They increase in riches. Verse 13, surely then in vain have I cleansed my heart and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long I've been smitten and plagued and chastened every morning. From verse 21, for my heart was grieved, embittered and in a state of ferment. I was pricked in my heart as with the sharp fang of an adder. So foolish, stupid and brutish was I and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. And this just describes um, what the heart is going through, surrounded by the wickedness and provocation of the world. And we really, as believers, struggle not to become embittered. Um, it, it's it, because there's a lot of hatred of Satan and venom that he is trying to inflict and impart on us on a daily basis. And this psalm describes it graphically and beautifully, accurately in poetic terms and poetic language. There's a lot of venom. Um, Paul describes it also as the leaven of malice. Uh, the thing that Satan wants to pump into your heart and until it kills your heart. Venom, jealousy, hatred, rivalry, strife, malice, slander, anger, wrath, bitterness, resentment, and all the other list of negative emotions that the uh, writers of the New Testament warn us not to be partakers of. Um, all uh, When we refuse to walk in the Spirit, uh, we are actually refusing his presence and his comfort. All of a sudden, we can find ourselves parched, famine, famished in our spirit, disillusioned, and really desperate. We start casting around for something to fill that void. And instead of repenting and softening our heart and returning to the Holy Spirit, to the Lord, we turn to alluring substitutes that are offered to us everywhere. You can't rest or grow on the mean streets of Satan's playground. You're going to be barely able to survive. This is not the ground to thrive in. It's a ground of thorns, thistles, hard rocks, arid conditions, voracious birds. No good thing grows in these conditions that are expressed in this psalm. And it's, if we are believers trying to function in the world with an embittered attitude, I tell you truly, we're not going to last long. We will find it very difficult to be comfortable at all, even in our own skins, because our emotions are out of control and at the mercy of every agent of darkness. So one of the first things the Holy, Do Holy Spirit does is to help us identify our negative emotions and make the choice not to entertain them. He's described as the spirit of truth. So whenever you ask for the Holy Spirit's help, I'm just I'm going to warn you, brace yourself, because the first thing that's going to happen when he comes is he's going to bring the truth. He's a mirror so that you can see yourself and your own negative emotion. And all you have to do is come into agreement with him and say, Lord, you're right. I do feel bitter. I do feel angry. I'm very resentful at the things that are going on here. And I just bring you my emotion and set it before you. And the work of the Holy Spirit, in a nutshell, is to strengthen you, to come alongside you. He'll enable you, actually more accurately, to access that victory of Christ, that strength of Christ. So in an immediate flow, he's going to help you tap in to that resurrection power of Jesus that's resident in your own life. However, However, his means of doing so are predominantly covert, predominantly passive, rather than through active strength. That's one of the reasons the Holy Spirit is one of the most elusive members of the Trinity, because most of the time he is working in a passive or covert manner. And what this means is that when we yield when we yield 
our will. We make a decision of will. We're the proactive partner. We decide. He does not enforce his will over us. When we yield our will, when we yield our emotion, immediately he enters into the deep places in us and to heal us back into wholeness. Of course, the Holy Spirit still manifests in signs, wonders, miracles, and spiritual gifts that we're privileged to be part of. But his working is, in fact, in nature, closer to an iceberg. Think of the Holy Spirit as an iceberg. They say that nine-tenths of an iceberg is below the surface. In the deeps of the human soul is really, in the nine-tenths below the surface, that's really where the functioning of the Holy Spirit predominates. Um, that's what we call sanctification. This work of transformation that's going on in the deep, dark places of your spirit, and, and but every now and again it flashes forth and you realize you really are being changed. So what we call sanctification is mostly the mothering work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus boasts about the third member of the Trinity, and he assures us, he assures his disciples, that this new era that they're about to enter in will be unprecedented in power and their ability to access him through the Holy Spirit. And he's the agency through which all three members of the Trinity are going to be present in the upcoming era. So that's why an understanding of this whole Paracletos idea has never been more critical. If you're looking for comfort in the world, you are not going to get it. Uh, we need desperately uh, this understanding of knowing how to submit to the presence and working of the Holy Spirit and just receive this whole gift of mothering that the Lord would love to bestow on us. We need the Holy Spirit. So let's for a moment just take a look at some of this mother issue. Now, uh, even as I begin to use this imagery or this language, some of you are going to feel uncomfortable. But I, even though I show you the very scripture where God himself declares his intent to restore mothering, some of you may still remain dubious. It's going to take some convincing for you to believe that, number one, you need some restoration in the mothering category. And number two, it's the job of the Holy Spirit to do that. Okay, so let's hone in. Uh, let's take a look at what, if you've got a deficit of mothering, a deficit of godly mothering, a deficit of the Holy Spirit in your life, this is what it's going to look like. Okay, sometimes it's easier to define things in negative terms rather than in positive terms. And just like a photograph, if you want a good photograph, you're going to need to understand the chiaroscuro, the shades of darkness and light that form the entire composition. Okay, if you find it difficult to express these emotions or to receive them, gentleness, tenderness, nurturing, kindness, clemency, patience, long-suffering in di with difficult people or difficult situations especially. If, there, you, if you have a difficulty receiving these softer, more passive emotions, you've got a mothering issue. If there's an inability to be honest, vulnerable, open-hearted, and authentic in relationships, you've got something to hide? You need the Holy Spirit to heal you. These emotions are still considered weakness to you. Instead of proper covenant behavior, you're still thinking that if you show softer emotions, you're going to look weak. Your relationships are still filled with the thorns of little white lies, scorekeeping, faking it, passive-aggressive behavior, and the inability to speak the truth in love and let your love be without hypocrisy. Let your love be genuine, without dissimulation. You need the Holy Spirit. If you find yourself suspicious of people all the time, especially if they're doing something kind, if you are stubborn, obstinate, 
and you have graceless behavior uh, with unprovoked areas of cruelty that manifest unexpectedly when triggered. Oh, let me say that again. That if you have stubborn, obstinate, graceless behavior with unprovoked areas of cruelty that manifest unexpectedly through certain triggers, that's a sign you've got unhealed wounds, you've got unhealed trauma. If you are harsh or sharp, if there's a need to always contend, to defend your ground, get your, make sure you get your rights, always get the last word in, always be right, you got some mothering issues. If you find yourself disproportionately violent in your response to conversations or relationship issues, you got some triggers, some hot buttons. If you find a disproportionate need to dominate or control situations, just cause, just for the pleasure of it, I want to be the one in control. I want to be the one who has the last word. I want to be the one who's the dominating influence here. Um, if you cannot uh, do th something for anyone that does not specifically and directly benefit you, if you just simply will not do anything good unless there's something in it for you, you've got a wounding. If you can never apologize for anything or admit you were wrong or listen to the feelings of others, acknowledge the justifiable emotions of people that you have wounded or wronged, you need the Holy Spirit. If you're still struggling with parental relationships and all the surrounding dynamics, either male or female, and if you have big trust issues, especially in relationship to the opposite sex, and you cannot form healthful relationships, male, female, you need the mothering of the Holy Spirit. We need to learn, again, about authentic intimacy, firstly with ourselves, secondly with our God, and thirdly with others. We've lost the ability to know both ourselves and God because this is the fundamental intimacy which is key in having faith enough within ourselves to trust others and to let them into significant places of our lives. And that's a perfect description of the realm of the divine intervention of Parakletos. When we are able to be healed within ourselves and embrace the love of God for us, we make peace with ourselves. We begin to love ourselves and uh, Fear, inferiority, condemnation, and self-hatred are actually being dissolved. The bonds and the lies are actually being dissolved by the blood of Jesus in the working of the Holy Spirit. His presence in us is to impart nourishing, nurture, comfort, and discipline. And he accomplishes this through the long process of teaching through the Word of God, training, reproof, experience, and also just plain resting. And in the coming age of tribulations on the earth, the work of the Holy Spirit is going to be greatly apparent because believers are going to be able to dwell in a kind of land of Goshen-like quality when all hell is breaking loose around them. They're going to be the peaceful, unaffected, because they're drawing their uh, peace and rest and comfort, not off world conditions, but off the Lord himself. His presence and power are going to rest on believers, it says in Peter, a spirit of grace and glory, and it's going to allow us to navigate perilous times with grace and confidence and authority. And his work as the comforter in our life is going to be greatly magnified. It's going to be shown to the world by the composure and calmness of his people. And it's going to stand out as starkly as a gem against black velvet, against the background of fear, panic, and gross violence, which are described in the end times. And in a virtual world of the internet, which is now characterized 
by lies, exaggeration, illusion, and all manner of deceptions. The spirit of truth will make our navigation sure because he's going to give us supernatural ability to discern the spirits. And another one of his key roles is to turn our fear back into awe for the Lord. And with this restoration and the retraining of our faculties in the discernment of good and evil, um, we're going to be able to discern strongholds of occult control and influence when we enter them. And we're going to be able to navigate highly charged political atmospheres and strongholds of conspiracy, uh, not to mention the more immediate difficulties of the nuclear life of the family. Because the job, one of the job descriptions that I just love is where the Holy Spirit is described as overshadowing. In Deuteronomy 33, there's a beautiful scripture about how the Holy Spirit is likened unto the eagle that stirs up his nest, that broods over his young, that takes them abroad on his wings and teaches them and trains them. It's a beautiful picture of the overshadowing function the Lord works in us internally, but he's also an overshadowing cover and protection. He is um, helping us with intimacy and self-mastery. He is nourishing and discipling and training, but he's also our protection and our defense. He's the overshadowing, the overcoverer. And um, the mandate of the Holy Spirit is actually so in extensive. I could preach probably for a few uh, sessions on it because each one of his offices is extremely critical and important and significant um but i want to i want to train uh focus on two of the main ones and it's this he trains us he teaches us he restores to us the heart of god within us and to us and also imparts to us the emotion and control of Jesus, the mastery of Jesus. And, and in all this, he also teaches us about our own heart. And um, Deuteronomy 32 verses 10 to 13 uh, is, is that wonderful picture of that. But also in the Psalms, the psalmist says, when my heart is overwhelmed within me, then you know my path. That's uh, an excellent place for our understanding of where the Holy Spirit comes in the nine tenths below the surface. Because many times our hearts do overwhelm us. We're, we become overcome by the sheer range and depth of our own emotional potential. Um, it, it, it's lying like a great deep within us. It's dark, cold, and full of pressure the lower down we go. It's not a place many of us long to explore. Uh, there be dragons. There are creatures down in the deep. We are terrified of unknown forces and cruel beasts we may encounter in the depths. So we need... Um, the Holy Spirit and to come into agreement with the emotions of God when he's leading us. So one of the things about learning about the heart of God is actually described in Hebrews 12 verses 6 to 10, Hebrews 12, and it talks about the chastening of the Lord, but the summation is this, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son he receives. And the, the, the paradox of faith is that if we want to receive the comfort, we actually create capacity for comfort through discipline. When we receive the discipline and the, the teaching and the reproof of the Holy Spirit, he's trying to lead us away from the things that enslave us and he's trying to make us free and walk us into the peace and the joy discipline is God's way of removing all the things within us that separate and alienate us from him and from his life it's a paradox but the only way to stay in the rest of God 
is actually to walk through the season of discipline the Lord has you in. Just stay with the cloud. Stay with the cloud no matter where it moves. And um, so we know, we talked about it, that in Genesis 1, the, the movement of the Holy Spirit upon the face of the waters, he had this initial job of creation and order and sustaining. It, you know, the Holy Spirit is very comfortable, if you want to put it this way, working with chaos conditions or working in the void, working where there's lack. He knows how to bring order and rhythm and balance and symmetry and consistency. And these are God's undergirding tools that sustain and maintain and actually revitalize the physical universe. Because nothing thrives in chaos. Natural and spiritual laws are the sustaining principle of the foundation of the universe. But the moral code that God gave man is um, the foundation of our universe as created beings. And it, 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 the moral law actually holds up the physical universe too, because of course the character of God holds it up. And it, it holds it by his word of power. So here's the thing, you cannot violate the moral laws of the universe and expect to thrive in the physical realm. So it's the job of the Holy Spirit to teach us about God's nature so that we come into agreement with the laws, both physical, spiritual, and uh, moral that are upholding the universe, Jesus' victory. And with this knowledge, we live and rest in the very same victory were, whereby Jesus overcame the world. So the, the other major job of the Holy Spirit is actually just to impart this victory and impart the things of Jesus to us. All of his virtue, all of his experience and power are actually right now resident in you because your spirit is joined to the spirit of Jesus. But without the training and the instruction of the Holy Spirit, we will not know how to access the power that is already deeply resident within us. Um, Galatians 5 verses 20 to 22, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the work which his presence within accomplishes, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. His emotion, when we receive the Holy Spirit, his emotion actually overshadows us, just like a hen brooding over the chicks. You know, it's, it's one of the major revelations of life and growth in the Holy Spirit to understand that you don't need to suffer the tyranny of your own emotion. There are times when you feel overwhelmed, but by faith, I, I can say, I am so angry, I am so overwrought, I, I'm, I'm ready to tear someone's head off. But by my will, I make the decision that I'm going to step into the emotion of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has an unlimited amount of self-control. He's got an unlimited amount of gentleness, kindness, patience, and joy. And right now, I just completely forsake my own emotion, and I step into his. I just bring my emotion and lay it at his feet and say, Lord, this is too dark, dangerous, and it's like a bomb that's going to go off. So I just bring it to you. You diffuse it. And we can actually do that. I can simply step into back into the Eden of the emotion of the Holy Spirit, and I don't need to stay on the toxic cesspool of my own emotion. I can escape the wild beast of my own fallen nature and all the serpents of darkness trying to be at my feet. I can come back into the protected place of emotional control simply by an act of will. God did not create us to be dominated by emotion. Many, many people, most people do not know this, but will, will dominate emotion. All you have to do is make the decision, no, I am not going to stay in this negative emotion. I'm going to walk it right over to God, release it to him, and let him deal with it. And the Holy Spirit helps make us aware of our, more aware of our own dark emotion and the, the diseased dialogue of our own heart. 
so that we're aware of it. So when we're aware of it, we can relinquish it. And we have an ability through him to master our own desire, our own ambition, our own emotion, and to counterbalance it with the word of God and, in, and actively relying on him. And um, Psalm 131, David describes this. He says, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor are my eyes lofty. Neither do I um, exercise myself in matters too great or things too wonderful for me. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me, ceased from fretting. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. So the Holy Spirit is going to help us take the, the scripture and superimpose it over the situations of our life. And, the, and it will override our own emotional confusion, instability, and fear. Because he's going to keep imparting God's faithfulness and character to us. And we, we're, he's going to help us cultivate this ability to calm ourselves and to call on him when we're in distress. Just receive him by faith. Holy Spirit, come right now as the comforter. I need you, Lord. Advocate for me. Protect me from myself. And all we have to do is say that because we enter the spiritual realm with words. Call for the Holy Spirit and the Paracletos will be there. And you need to understand and receive by faith. You can receive by faith the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the emotion of the Holy Spirit in whatever situation and understand that he is going to come to you and overshadow you and protect you even from yourself and certainly from the flaming fiery darts of the evil one. So let his emotion his will be greater than your own. You can make that decision. This is the product of spiritual discipline. Uh, this is what we call, when we learn the mastery of self-control and the passive strength of just receiving the Holy Spirit in the deep places of our spirit, this is what the scripture calls the rest of God. And the scripture goes on to describe uh, in fact, previously, Galatians 5, 19 to 21, it describes the spiritual condition of someone who is not dominated by the Holy Spirit, who is not walking in the Spirit, but who's walking in the flesh. Galatians 5, 19, now the doings of the flesh are clear. They are immorality, impurity, indecency, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, selfishness, divisions, party spirit. Envy, drunkenness, carousing, and the like. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So this is the description of a diseased heart that refuses the love of God and all the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit. And this is a, a, a very, very sad and dangerous state of affairs. Um, it's a dangerous heart because in the final analysis, it just can't be trusted. There are some definite types of behavior that this heart becomes snared in. And I can't cover this exhaustively because there's just such a list of negativity. But I want to hone in on one word here, and it's the word sorcery. Any other, several translations may render it differently. It could be called witchcraft. But it technically, it is the Greek word pharmakeia, from which we get the word pharmacy. And, but what it means actually at the time it was written in Greece is the use of medicine, drugs, or spells. Uh, you know how um, many religious cultures use drugs to enhance spiritual states. And what it's, but what it's actually doing is opening the door for occult possession. And the Holy Spirit describes this as pharmakeia. And, um, it can also be the use of not only drugs, but religious incantations or negative speaking actually has the ability to put a thrall of negativity or a spell around a, a certain atmosphere and situations. And it, this idea 
of uh, the pharmakeo or the pharmakeos, who is a, force, a poisoner, a sorcerer, or a magician, appears in the New Testament. It appears in the book of Acts, in Acts 13 and Acts 8. Uh, Eliamus the wise man and Simon the sorcerer, both of those stories are stories of the power of pharmakeia at work over a situation. And um, if you look at the apostolic response, you'll notice that the apostles applied very strong measures in dealing with the Spirit. Um, the Holy Spirit, through the apostles, took very strong measures. And from his response, we can gather that this Spirit is not to be indulged or tolerated for a moment. It's an extremely seductive and enslaving agency, and it's everything Jesus died to set us free for. And um, other references in scripture, if you're interested in this, include Revelation 9, 21, Revelation 18, 23, 21, 8, and 22, 15. Um, and in these passages, we're told that whoever practiced sorcery and the other sins listed will never enter the gates of the new city or the kingdom itself. And this is a very ancient pagan practice. Drugs have been used to enhance spiritual experiences. Uh, and... Um, even in uh, used with many occult related practices, incantation, spell casting, divination, blood sacrifice, necromancy, and other detailed works that are described. Uh, those are listed in Deuteronomy 18. But over the last um, 50 years, the spirit of addiction and especially drug use has exploded upon the earth and Satan is using these issues of addiction to bind entire generations. And the whole, one of the main functions of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit continually breaks this grip of addiction and pharmakeia in whatever way it's manifesting. And so the Holy Spirit is able, and I believe that we are coming up to the place in the season where people are going to be so anointed, so filled with the Holy Spirit, they're going to be able to speak to people who are addicted and see them immediately released from their bonds. That's the kind of anointing that's rising from Paracletos. And so um, just in closing... Let's consider the words of Romans 8:26. So too the Holy Spirit comes to our aid and bears us up in our weakness, for we do not know what prayer to offer or how to offer it worthily as we ought. But the Spirit himself goes to meet our supplication and pleads on our behalf with unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for utterance. So the Holy Spirit is able to help us at levels deeper than we can even understand or give words for, uh, places where we're wounded, where we failed, where we have deep, deep fear. We, we, we can't even describe it. Um, have you ever come to a place in your life that was so stressful, you were so out of your league, you didn't even know how you felt, you didn't even know how you, what to do, you couldn't even pray, you were absolutely overwhelmed. Well, if you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, this is the time you need to be praying in tongues. Because what happens when you pray in tongues is that you release the whole situation to the Holy Spirit. And he begins to speak through you over your atmosphere, over your environment, over your body. And he begins to release the will of God. And it will actually break the thrall that the enemy is trying to bring you in and, and cause destruction over you. Um, we, because we, in our lives, it's not just about dealing with our own emotions. We also have to interact with the emotions and mindsets of others. And at times that can get really, really tricky. We need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. And especially it's wisdom at a higher level when we can begin to receive the spiritual gifts from the, of the charismata, um, from the Holy Spirit, when we can function in a very high prophetic level in partnership with him and release his will into situations. And also we can break the power of these thralls and, and um, occult strongholds and the spirit of pharmakeia. The Lord wants to be very uh, aggressive with people who will be used of him to bring 
redemption and salvation into these exceedingly dark places. The comforter wants to come and work through you. And, and when we will receive the Holy Spirit at higher and higher levels, when we will submit to his working, when we will pray faithfully in tongues, when we will speak out the prophetic, the Holy Spirit will come and amaze us in the level of his working. And that is the mothering of the Trinity will be restored to us. And we will be able to restore mothering to the loving people around us. We'll be able to be um, anointed apostolic mothers in the, uh, and fathers in the circumstances of our lives. Thank you, Father, for the incredible gift of the Holy Spirit. And I pray for everyone listening that they will receive you at higher and higher levels. They'll just open up your heart, their heart to your sweet and beautiful working that you would overshadow them even now, Lord, in whatever places of fear and despair they find themselves. Impart the things of Jesus to us, Lord. We deeply need to be changed and transformed. We need to do the things Jesus did and even greater works. I thank you, Parakletos, for your deep work, and I receive you at a greater level. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.